Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for Halloween Folklore, History, Traditions, and Customs. Join paranormal author and ghost tour guide Roxy Zwicker for her popular presentation on Halloween Folklore. Get taken on an enchanted voyage into the magic of Halloween season as the spiritual veil, veil to the uh, other world is at its thinnest at this time of the year. Discover the intriguing history of Halloween in early America, dive into the traditions of the holiday and delight in Halloween themed uh, divinatory tools, costumes and Victorian parties. Uh, Zwicker is the author of the Massachusetts Book of the Dead, Graveyards, Legends, and Lores, and at least eight other paranormal books. She was just telling me earlier that she, she just published uh, one on um, the, um, I'm going to mess this up, I think it was the Connecticut Book of the Dead, and she's also working on the Vermont Book of the Dead. Uh, so she's cranking out these books. Uh, and she's also, um, more importantly, she's also the author of New England Curiosities, which is a, a New England a ghost tour guide company. Uh, again, want to thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library, uh, as well as the libraries and friends groups in Boxford, Clinton, Drake at Lowell, Norwood, and Hudson, New Hampshire. So all of us watching uh, live here on Zoom and those that will be watching uh, on demand, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Roxy for joining us here tonight. And Roxy, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Well Thank you everyone so much for being here. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you, to work with the Tewksbury Public Library once again. Um, I am really excited because you're here and it is the first day of October. So I'm really hoping that you are all settled in and getting ready for this fantastic season. So um, I am coming to you right now from the beautiful historic city of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which goes back to 1623. I am currently sitting in our 1870 meeting house in the South End, which is rumored to be haunted. So we'll have to see what happens this evening. So I am going to go into a share screen mode. So through the magic of technology, I'm going to wave my magic wand to bring us into the world of Halloween. And I'm really um, delighted to share some of my own personal Halloween collection with you. It was really quite a joy to do the graphics for this program, um, pulling some of the antique and vintage items that I have in my collection. So um, you'll get to see a, a lot of the uh, ephemera and postcards and things that I collect related to Halloween. So let's go. Halloween legends, lore, and customs with me, Roxy Zwicker from New England Curiosities. It is that time of year where the leaves are changing. There's a chill to the air and you know the pumpkins just start appearing out of nowhere. And our mind turns to this time of year, this harvest time, this time where the days are getting shorter and the nights are getting longer and the world around us becomes incredibly colorful. So this image that you see here on your screen is of uh, beautiful Rye, New Hampshire. And uh, if you are anything like me here in New England, um, you just cannot get enough of the beautiful scenery and foliage and old stone walls. But is there a little bit more that calls us to the Halloween season. Some of us love to say we celebrate it all year long. And of course we find ourselves this time of year going to um, you know, farm stands and apple orchards. This is all, um, these are all images from a recent trip that I took to uh, Applecrest Farms. And you just delight in the color and the scents and the textures. You know, there's nothing like a, you know, hot apple cider hanging you know, wreaths on your door with the colors of the season, uh, you know, having, who doesn't love having um, apple cider donuts, you know, painting pumpkins. Uh, there's so many things happening throughout the season, but do we really know where some of these traditions and customs come from? You know, why do we, uh, you know, paint pumpkins or carve pumpkins? Why do we hang corn on our door? Where do pumpkins actually come from? Um, is there something to even the colors of the season and the flavors of the season? 
So this beautiful house that you see on your screen is about two steps outside of the doorstep where I am right now. It's a beautiful house from 1710. And it has all of the trappings of the Halloween season. You have the beautiful wreath on the door, the pumpkins, the kale, the flowers. So what is with all of these traditions? Why are there pumpkins on doorsteps? Is there something special about mums that maybe we don't even know? That maybe there's a, a deeper meaning to the things that we do for the season? All right, so let's take a look at our checklist uh, for the Halloween season. Now, as we go into this evening's presentation, please know I am not the be all end all um, for this information. There is a lot of information out there. I'm sharing with you some of the interesting sort of facts and history that I found over the years that I thought you would might find interesting, but there is much, much more. So um, this is sort of a little bit of the list that I wanted to start with. So it is the time between summer and winter. It is the time of light and dark. Uh, a lot of people think about divination games, fortune telling. It's time to finish our preparations. It's been a long summer. So now it's time to start thinking inward and preparing for the long cold winter ahead. It's time to honor the shadows. You know, we, we talk about ghosts and spirits probably more this time of year than any other time of year, but why? Um, nourishment, you know, making sure that we have enough to sustain ourselves in the coming months. It's a time of the unknown. So if we go back to the 17th and 18th century at a time when there was, you know, no electricity and the world around us was dark and full of shadow and we heard strange noises coming from the woods. There's things that we didn't know and sometimes our imagination would fill in the blanks. Um, the natural cycle of things, you know, really tuning into the cycle of the earth, you know, noticing again the, the trees you know, shedding their leaves, the colors that are around us, um, you know, everything going from flower to seed right now or flower to fruit. Um, clearing the fields and thinking about, you know, back in the spring, some of the things that we sort of set our mind to, some of our intentions, and now reflecting on that and saying, you know what, what worked for me this summer? And maybe there were things that were on your to-do list that we didn't quite get to. So um, maybe, you know, we can let go of those things and, you know, make room as we move forward into this time. And of course, a lot of us think about our ancestors because it is a time of of spirits, um, of, you know, ghost stories. So you can't forget your ancestors in a lot of cultures. This is a very important time to honor our ancestors. So Halloween, let's sort of break it down for a second here. So Halloween, hallowed evening or Samhain. I know it looks like Samhain, but it's actually pronounced Samhain, um, which is the end of the summer. It is, uh, you know, it's always that interesting moment when we sort of flip that calendar and we turn around and what seemed to be like an endless summer, summer is over. And now we are thrust into this very beautiful, but particularly here in New England, short season of, um, of fall. All right, so let's go back in the New England Curiosities time machine for a minute. We're going to go back 2000 years. Harvest was a matter of life and death for the Celts. And that's where a lot of the roots of this holiday lie. Would there be enough food? Humans could get lost in the world of spirits and likewise, spirits would walk amongst the living. The crops for the agricultural people were dying at this time of year. So it was really important to pull in as much as you could from the fields to work you know, day and night to make sure that food was preserved and stored properly as the world starts to die around us. It was also a time of commuting with otherworldly spirits, with big bonfires lit in honor of the dead. Empty chairs would be left by the fire to help welcome passing spirits. The word bonfire is most likely from the words bone fire and dates back to the burning of the bones of St. John the Baptist by the Roman Emperor Julian in the fourth century AD. In AD 680, the Catholic Church attempted to abolish 
the practice of lighting bonfires. And in 742, they condemned the practice of using a need fire to spark kindling. So here you can see um, this beautiful bonfire that I had out on Star Island on the Isles of Shoals, which is just off of our New Hampshire coast. There's something about standing by a bonfire, the warmth, the crackling sounds as the sun goes down and the shadows creep in around you at this time of year. So John Sinclair wrote in the 1790s about Scotland, quote, they set up bonfires in every village. When the bonfire is consumed, the ashes are carefully collected in a circle. There is a stone put in for every person of the several families. And whatever stone is moved out of its place or injured before the next morning, the person represented by that stone is supposed to not live 12 months from that date. So here you can see already, you know, going back to the 18th century, the different methods of not only using the bonfire as a representation of what's going on and kindling that need fire, but also it was used in different forms of divination as well. Um, it's quite fascinating to think about all of the things that would be put into a bonfire as well. Um, you know, whether it was to set intentions for the season ahead, whether it was offerings to spirits, God, goddess, deity. So let's look at a couple of the most popular colors for this year. And, you know, we, I'm wearing black and orange right now. Um, and do we really understand why black and orange is, um, you know, sort of the, the colors of Halloween? I mean, purple's great too, and some people like green, but predominantly black and orange. So orange is a color sacred to many deities associated with harvest time. It's also the color of the glowing embers and dancing flames of the sacred and magical Samhain bonfires that once illuminated the night. A strong banishing color, black is associated with transition, the night and rest. It's always been sort of written in a lot of cultures to burn a black candle to absorb negativity, to break a bad habit, or mark the end of a phase in your life. So again, the end of the summer. So with the traditional colors of Halloween being black and orange, it is evident in everything from Halloween window decorations to the candles that burn brightly upon the altar to honor the dead and to celebrate the season. Orange reflects the holiday's ancient connection to agriculture and its celebration as a pre-Christian harvest festival. Orange, the color of pumpkins and autumn leaves, evokes the spirit of the fall season. So continuing with our history lesson, several Christian popes attempted to replace what were thought to be pagan holidays like Samhain with events of their own design. By 1000 AD, All Souls Day on November 2nd served as a time for the living to pray for the souls of the dead. All Saints Day assigned to November 1st, obviously honored saints, but was also called All Hallows. So that made October 31st, All Hallows Eve, and later Halloween. In 601 AD, Pope Gregory I issued a now famous edict to his missionaries concerning the native beliefs and customs of the people that he had hoped to convert. Rather than try to obliterate native people's customs and beliefs, the Pope instructed his missionaries to use them. If a group of people worshiped a tree rather than cut it down, he advised them to consecrate it to Christ and allow its continued worship. Despite the new religious focus, people in old England and Ireland continued to associate the time with the wandering dead. They sent out gifts of food to please the spirits and as time wore on, people would dress in scary costumes in exchange for treats themselves, a practice called mumming, which is very similar to today's trick-or-treating. One of the most famous descriptions of a Scottish Halloween bonfire comes from the Englishman Thomas Pennant, who kept extensive journals of his travels and recorded this particular scene in 1772. Hallow Eve is also kept sacred. As soon as it's dark, a person sets fire to a bush of broom fastened around a pole and attended with a crowd runs round the village. 
He then flings it down, keeps a great quantity of combustible matters in it, and makes a great bonfire. A whole tract is thus illuminated at the same time and makes a fine appearance. So we've mentioned um, England, Scotland, and Ireland. So there are lots of tidbits of folklore about Halloween also being a time for fairies and goblins to frolic. For a lot of people, when they think of fairies, they might think of May Day or perhaps even um, summer solstice you know, or Midsummer's Eve. But the fairies and um, elves and goblins that are said to be around Halloween, are they in disguise? Are they looking for souls or is it something else? So let's take a look at a little bit of this folklore around Halloween. In Scottish Halloween fairy lore, a spunky, that's their name, in the Scottish Highlands where it would take the form of a boy who carried a flaming torch to light the way for the pedestrians in exchange for a fee, leading the unwary travelers to their doom. The spunky has also been blamed for shipwrecks at night after being spotted on land and mistaken for a harbor light. Other tales of Scottish folklore regard these mysterious lights as omens of death or the ghosts of once living human beings. They often appeared over locks or on roads along which funeral processions were known to travel, and especially on Halloween. The first similar celebrations in America predominantly arose in the Southern colonies. People would celebrate the harvest, swap ghost stories, and even tell each other's fortunes. However, those early festivals were known as play parties, not Halloween and were actually more for adults than children. So part of those play parties would be to dress up. And one of the easiest forms of dressing up and something that you'll find in many, many cultures all around the world across the ages would be masks. And masks seem perfect for celebrating the season. Can you trick the ghosts and spirits into believing that you are one of them? Or who might you be with a mask? Thing about the mask, there is a lot of sort of ways of being anonymous with the mask. Perhaps there is someone that you are hoping to be, not unlike what you see, of course, today with people donning masks of, you know, uh, superheroes and, um, you know, all sorts of different themes, ones that really sort of speak to the imagination. But also wearing a mask, if there were any, you know, um, sort of ill will spirits that were going by or, you know, mischievous, uh, you know, gnomes or fairies or goblins, that with a mask, you might just blend in with the rest of them and they might leave you alone. So traditions came over to the new world in the 19th century and they were quickly adapted into celebrations. So the masks or the face paint that was used by the Celts to hide in plain sight from wandering spirits, ghosts or fairies roaming the world while the veil was thin. And again, magically creating or wearing a mask to represent something about yourself that you want to transform or embody. Maybe you want to be as brave as that superhero. And um, I just, I love this vintage picture um, with these, uh, you know, antique homemade masks, probably far scarier than anything that you're going to find um, in any department store. So we talked about fairies, let's, um, you know, talk about uh, goblins and, and other spirits that sort of, uh, you know, run around on uh, Halloween night. So um, here's a, another great uh, vintage postcard. You can see the, the goblins just sort of uh, taking over the kitchen here. So it was thought to sort of combat these mischievous spirits was to just sprinkle flaxseed on the floor. And being a compulsive housekeeper, a goblin will feel obliged to pick it up. 
And after a while, he'll tire and leave, thus not making a, a mess of the kitchen or of the house. Sort of similar to um, offerings that would be put out for fairies, um, whether it was um, butter or milk or honey or even brownie spirits that could actually be very benevolent. But again, it was all in the way that you treated them and quite often on Halloween. So I think for most everybody, we are, you know, we associate probably one of the most often seen images of Halloween being either the pumpkin or the jack-o'-lantern. Um, the jack-o'-lanterns really originated with a cautionary tale about a man called Stingy Jack. And he was such a jerk that he couldn't get into heaven or hell and was actually doomed to walk the earth with a carved turnip lantern. In areas like Ireland and Scotland, people would actually hollow out turnips or large beets and they carve faces into them. And these small effigies were actually lit from within with a glowing coal or even a candle stump and placed near gates and doorways to welcome spirits of loved ones and to frighten off any dark spirits that might pass by. So as we started to move throughout the 1800s and we were moving you know, from masks into full-blown costumes and again you know very very homemade um and you know i i want to uh you know just re reflect here for a moment um on this you know that it was a very different time um so you know i want to make sure that i am uh, politically correct and i don't mean any slight um uh, in uh, the description of these costumes but these were what people were wearing at the time um people became fascinated with impersonating all sorts of characters um, pirates, um, gypsies, um, homeless people, you know, scarecrows, um, goblins, witches, like people that, you know, really were very intriguing to folks. They would go and sort of fashion their own costumes out of all sorts of interesting things. So here are a, uh, a couple of costumes that you would have imported from overseas. So the costume on the left, um, again, these are both 19th century, is from France. The one on the right is from Germany. And I just love that bat headpiece. I think it's just so amazing. Um, I, I think I almost want one. So there were lots of suggestions and even etiquette about wearing costumes for Halloween. So it was announced that, uh, that couples should form for a grand march. A goblin bowed to a queen of hearts, a clown to a nun, and just as fancy sees them, gay and sober, joined hands to trip together a merry two-step in and out of the room, through doors and curtains, a line of fantastic figures. And this is from um, Harper's Bazaar, uh, October 27th, 1900, uh, in an article uh, about games for Halloween. And just look at um, this brilliant costume here. Uh, you know, really uh, just, you can sort of see the pairings, uh, you know, and the creativity that people had. Um, and, and also consider, you know, that time frame, um, you didn't really go to uh, the store to buy your clothing. You know, your clothing was made by seamstresses or you would make it yourself. So it really was taking on this creative way of getting dressed up in these costumes. So here is an early um, 1900s party favor guide here and they're just all so fantastic. Uh, here on the left, you can see this amazing collection of antique and vintage favors, which people really go crazy for um, these days and collect them. If you've ever been to an antique shop and seen these for sale, um, they really do command a high price. And the reason for that is, is, you know, these were all really made to be very disposable. You know, you'd use it for that Halloween and then throw it away. But I love the association that you can make again with the beliefs. We see lots of pumpkins and jack-o'-lanterns, um, lots of interesting faces, which we would see um, on some of the masks as well. 
So um, I, I have such a, an affinity uh, for these um, fantastic old uh, vintage Halloween antiques. While I have an affinity, I don't necessarily have a pocketbook for one, but I can look from afar. At the turn of the 20th century, Halloween was seen as a day outside of normal, when you act outside of society's norms. Wearing ghoulish costumes was an essential part of it. People in rural America really embraced the idea of it as a dark occasion centered around death. They wore scary, frightening getups, which were made at home with whatever was on hand, sheets, makeup, improvised masks. Again, being anonymous was a big part of the costume. The whole point of dressing up was to be completely in disguise. So that way people did not have any idea who you were. And again, look at these great homespun costumes here. Again, scarier than anything you could buy off of the rack. By the 1920s and 1930s, people were holding annual Halloween masquerades aimed at both adults and children at rented salons or family homes. Costume preparations sometimes began as early as August. So in order for you to build your entire costume, let alone to have a, a gathering, it really required a lot of time, and energy, and sourcing of materials for that. So these are a couple of uh, pieces that I have in my collection on this beautiful vintage postcard on the right of these uh, young boys in Halloween costumes. And I also have a lot of a Halloween themed sheet music from the late 1800s and early 1900s because of course while people were gathered um, at these parties they needed to have some background uh, entertainment and typically it was piano playing. So I really love to, uh, to sort of collect these. I love the, the graphics and the colors and just to imagine you know what was going on around this um, you know this piano with all of the festivities. How were people celebrating? These are a couple of pages from a catalog um, that I have, I believe it's from the 19 teens of different sort of party favors, uh, you know, very early DIY, again, because um, it was, uh, you know, a lot of homespun things, and how to make these party favors and use the element of shadow. So again, thinking about the bonfires or fireplaces or candlelight. Uh, making these, you know, really frightening party favors, um, you know, from hand, and then you know, using those to uh, to scare everybody else at the gathering. Uh, the uh, little uh, pamphlet that I have also has this uh, DIY for Halloween peanut people. If you you know know how small peanuts are, these are pretty tiny, um, but you know, just they really did um, think of everything. Just such creativity. Um, and again, you know, more for the adults than for the kids um, suggested for uh, people to make. In Ireland and Brittany, um, the ghost of the recently deceased was easily angered. The deceased room must not be swept or dusted for fear of throwing out the soul. Food should be left for it and any vessel of water should be kept covered lest the soul drown in it. The spirits may be heard carrying on their ordinary occupations, weaving, plowing, or carpentering when they make their circuit of their old dwellings and farms. They must not be spoken to or interfered with in any passage through the house or farm that they have been accustomed to pass through must never be closed up. Otherwise, if the spirits meet with an obstacle, they will certainly take their revenge. So this is a, uh, a folk belief from the British Isles um, from Eleanor Hull in a book called Folklore of the British Isles um, written in 1928. So uh, you want to make sure that, you know, if you are expecting a spirit of a ancestor or a dearly departed loved one, that if they are moving through the property or the farm that they can sort of experience those spaces as they would have been back when they were alive because you don't want to anger the spirit. You want to honor them, um, not only in life, but on their path in death. So you heard me mention uh, divination uh, a little bit earlier and, and this still goes on. 
um, in different ways with, you know, um, bobbing for apples, probably not in COVID times, but um, bobbing for apples and different games that would be played um, on Halloween. And you'll find there's a lot of great old postcards out there with sort of tips and tricks and games. So there will be many Halloween apple games to divine one's romantic prospects. Eating an apple in several very specific ways on Halloween was thought to get a glimpse of a future spouse. Classic folk traditions tell eating an apple at midnight while brushing your hair will allow you to see a future spouse in the mirror over your shoulder. And if you peel an apple and as long as a strip as the entire apple, focusing on a future full of love as you toss the apple peel over your shoulder. When looking at the peel on the ground, taking note of its shape, it would resemble the initial of either the first or the last name of a future spouse. As I mentioned, um, bobbing for apples evolved from an older game called Snap Apple. An apple was suspended from a string and the players attempted to eat the dangling apple. The first to get a bite would be the first to marry. And sort of here's where the folklore and the, you know, the magic spell would come in. Girls would put their apple under the pillow on Halloween night to dream of their future husband. A less common apple love spell was to attempt eating an apple while looking in a mirror and walking down the stairs backwards. Not only would this be a great way to sustain a serious injury, but According to folklore, you would also see your future spouse in the mirror if you did it on Halloween night. I'm really not going to risk that. Um, I don't even know where somebody came up with the whole notion of that. Um, looking in a mirror, eating an apple, walking down the stairs backwards. Um, I just, I don't recommend it. Uh, here you can see in this uh, vintage postcard on Halloween, look into the glass, your future husband's face will pass. And there she is brandishing the, uh, the candle there. You can see the silhouette of the witch in the background there. All right, so a popular Halloween symbol, the bat, is connected with sorcery and death in various cultures. Its longtime association with the darker side of folklore and superstition no doubt has much to do with its habits of nocturnal flight and roosting in places such as caves and old ghostly ruins. When painted or engraved upon a bloodstone, a symbol of a bat is said to add great power to a witch's incantations and endow all practitioners of the magical arts with the power to conjure, control, and banish demons. As a totem and spirit guide, the message of the bat is to find your way in the dark, seeing through illusion, promoting intuition, and communication. And of course, bats would be seen around the bonfires, um, you know, back through history because all of the bugs would be attracted to the fire. So the bats would go and feast on the bugs around the fire. Of course, you also see the symbolism of ravens and crows. Um, they come from a family of birds called corvids and both are associated with Halloween. Crows and ravens were seen on the battlefield and in the grain fields associating them with both death and the harvest. Of course, the prevalent themes of Samhain and Halloween. Corvids picked the ground after the grain harvest was brought in looking for spilled grain, and they also dug for bugs in the ground. Corvids were yet another animal that people suspected were either witches or fairies in disguise, probably because of their odd behavior compared to other animals. Corvids are especially intelligent. Some use rudimentary tools, to figure out puzzles and even like to collect shiny objects. So you can see why people might find them unnervingly intelligent animals and possibly supernatural. Images of ravens and crows are said to be used in luck and protection spells. Owls are another nocturnal animal like the bat, but they are also portrayed on antique greeting cards, being chummy with both witches and black cats. Owls were sometimes suggested to be witches in disguise, but it is also suggested they may have joined the bats in the airborne harvest feasts, snatching up large moths or even small bats themselves from the air above the Samhain bonfires. Owls are also associated with wisdom. 
Many dark goddesses who rule over the dark half of the year have owls as their sacred animals. It's said that if you wanted to find your way through dark times to find wisdom and to seek the truth, you would include owl symbols in your decorations. And of course, plenty of vintage postcards out there like this one here, that of course has the owls on it. The web of a spider has come to represent time as well as fate. Both themes relevant during the time of the dying land and the onset of winter. There is a superstition that if you see a spider on Halloween, it may be one of your ancestors checking up on you. Um, my house is always decorated for Halloween because there's always some sort of spider web somewhere. Um, I try to be nice to the spiders, particularly knowing sort of the spiritual connection. So I try to let them go outside, but um, they still do unnerve me just a little bit. So I grew up in um, Western Massachusetts. Um, I live up here on the seacoast now. And um, in Western Massachusetts growing up back in the late 1970s, early 1980s, there was a thing called Cabbage Night. And I didn't quite understand um, what Cabbage Night was all about. And it was the night before Halloween. And Cabbage Night was really a time of mischief and frolic and um, some vandalism. It was a, a little bit um, kind of crazy on Cabbage Night. So there is actually some folklore um, about cabbage and kale as it relates to Halloween. Um, so cabbage and kale, unlikely magical tools that they may seem, were assumed by the Irish to possess great fortune telling powers. The foods were plentiful throughout the British Isles and young people pulled up kale plants to judge the nature of their future spouses from the taste of the stock. So a bitter stock meant a bitter mate. The shape, um, whether it was straight or curved, indicated the position or condition of the spine. And the amount of dirt clinging to the root really meant uh, sort of the degree of wealth that that person would have. And of course, here we go. The divination worked best if the kale was stolen and it was most telling if practice on Halloween. So mums, um, I actually just got the, uh, the mums that you're gonna see in these photos a couple of weeks ago from a local farm stand. And um, I just love mums, but there's even a little bit of folklore about mums as well. Um, often associated with protection, particularly of the metaphysical sort, chrysanthemums, easy for me to say, come in handy when working with the spirit world. In some traditions, they're a centerpiece for funeral decorations or grave memorials, most likely because they're blooming around uh, Samhain or Halloween. So mums, um, the flowers would be buried with the dead, um, you know, back in tradition as well. So it's very interesting to sort of look at, you know, that association again with this time of year. And then to look at the mums themselves they look like small suns. Again, sort of bringing in the last of that solar energy of the year. You can dry the heads of mums. You can use them in loose leaf incense blends um, for fall rituals. Again, sort of another uh, traditional folklore. Um, from a magical standpoint, like I said, these fall beauties are associated with the sun itself and thus are often associated with fire. So bringing in some of that solar energy. So you may or may not have made associations um, with cranberry bogs and Halloween. Um, I had not made an association uh, until I actually started working um, for a company that did haunted hayrides. Um, this was way back in 1993. I've been guiding people on haunted tours almost like forever. And um, we actually did the tours down in Carver, Massachusetts, just outside of Plymouth. And of course, you know that entire area down there is famous for its cranberries. I mean, that's where Ocean Spray is. So in doing the, um, the wagon rides through the cranberry bogs, I actually got to learn a lot about the spirit of the cranberry bogs themselves. 
So we think about cranberries being harvested, of course, this time of year, and that brilliant red color. Um, and there is actually a lot to it. So let's, let's spend a moment here um, on the Halloween spirit of the cranberry box. So cranberries are one of only three berries native to North America. They grow on low level vines and flourish in bogs, which that is to say they need acidic peat soil and fresh water to grow. Cranberries are also a berry of the North, commonly growing in Massachusetts, New Jersey, Oregon, Washington, Wisconsin, and Canada. Cranberries use a specific farming technique known as water harvesting. In this process, the cranberry vine filled bogs are flooded with water. Special farming equipment known as watering reels turn and stir the water into the flooded bogs, loosening the berries from the vine. Because the cranberries contain pockets of air inside them, they float to the surface, which makes them easy to corral and harvest. Cranberries can also be harvested the old fashioned way. Dry harvesting is the simple method of plucking the berry from the dry vines during the fall. Some beliefs have suggested that the bog deposits were offerings for protection or rituals to bring fertility to the land um, and the well being to the land's inhabitants. One cannot avoid the idea of a spooky, dank bog on a cold, dark night either. Perhaps it's the fact that the unstable marshy territory could lead to hazardous falls and injuries. And legend has it that the murky, watery parts of a bog were bottomless. So to step into one meant imminent doom. Um, Hans Christian Andersen shared many stories of the bog, most of which involved witches, elves, and fairies. And in English and Welsh folklore, will-o'-the-wisps are said to be glowing lights that would float above the bog. Some believed that they were benevolent fairy or nature spirits that acted as guides to lost travelers. On the other hand, some saw the will-o'-wisps as ill-spirited fairies, dark elves or spirits connected to the devils, which have, appear to have been victims of sacrifice having been discovered in bog. So the bog is the home of the cranberry, but it was also the sacrificial stomping ground of ancient societies in Northern Europe. Consider all of the archeological findings that have been discovered in bogs from Denmark, Scotland, England, Sweden, and Northern Germany. Things like daggers, swords, shields, spears, javelins, drinking vessels, sickles, um, Y-shaped dowsing rods and jewelry have all been recovered from bogs. Also recovered from a bog was the famous Gundestrop cauldron, a silver cauldron of Celtic origin, which had mythological narratives on it. Even more shockingly, excellently preserved human bodies, which appear to have been victims of sacrifice, have also been discovered in bogs. And it appears that to ancient society, the watery bog was a place of significant importance where sacrifices and treasures were willingly deposited. So um, I learned so much about bogs when I was doing um, the haunted hay rides down there because we went on those narrow paths right between the bogs and um, to sort of know that, you know, this fascinating history behind it. And, you know, we think about you know, this, this time of year, you know, people put out, you know, the witch's cauldron or they serve, you know, candy from um, plastic cauldrons. And, you know, the cauldron itself was thought to be a, a tool of plenty and a tool of abundance. So how interesting to find, you know, this amazing cauldron buried in a bog. So Halloween leaf uh, magical lore. It is said that on Halloween, there is a great magic to be found in an autumn leaf falling from a tree, but only if the leaf is caught by human hands before it makes its landing. Once a leaf has touched the ground, its magic is forever lost, according to folklore. The Halloween tradition of catching a falling leaf originated long ago in England, where it was believed to ensure continued happiness for the next 12 months or make a special wish come true. Another variation of this tradition runs that a falling leaf caught before reaching the ground on Halloween will ensure good health throughout the winter season. 
So here is a um, picture of my backyard. I have these um, amazing, um, beautiful oak trees. And this is actually a picture of my windshield. I came out on Halloween one day and this leaf was the only leaf on my windshield, uh, of course, from one of my beautiful oak trees. And you can see there's a little heart in it. So um, I thought, I just kind of took that as a, you know, a, a good sign for Halloween. You know, I totally uh, subscribe to a lot of the folklore, you know, positive intentions type of thing. So um, I just thought that was kind of cool. And I've always, ever since I was a little kid, um, just love to run out underneath the tree when the breeze is blowing um, all the leaves off the tree and try to catch as many as I could. So are you nuts about Halloween? Actually, there is an association with nuts and Halloween. Um, this is a great old uh, postcard. Here you can see uh, giving a little divination advice, uncertainty, hope, despair, and happily ever after. So um, pecans represented abundance, immunity, and sustenance. Almonds represented beauty, fertility, goddess energy, grief, hidden treasures, and hope. So discovering nut messages in the fire, the nut that blazed the brightest and longest indicated the truest lover in the craft. In um, Halloween, however, uh, sometimes they would take two nuts uh, for each person in the couple and throw them in the fire. And depending on whether or not they burn together to ash or jump away from each other, we'll tell you how that relationship will progress. Halloween was often referred to as nutcrack night and walnuts were used for breaking through challenges symbolizing endurance and hazelnuts represented marriage and family. So here you can see um, another great vintage postcard, may the Halloween nutshell unto you a good fortune tell a lucky Halloween and notice how it's very emerging from a nut. So here you can see um, a little candle I have out with a couple of acorns um, from my uh, oak trees in my backyard. At this time of year, um, when I am out touring in cemeteries, which is almost on a daily basis, a lot of people will start leaving coins on graves or gravestones. And uh, sometimes people ask about, you know, why are people doing this for, um, you know, sort of the Halloween season. Um, coins for remembrance, um, blessings, offerings. So this is the grave of Mary Nason, which is located in York, Maine. She was um, 29 years old when she died in 1774. As early as 1820, she was said to be the witch of Old York Village. And I think there's a lot of misunderstandings about the story. Um, she has this big slab um, over her grave. And as I go, um, you know, daily and weekly, there's more items that turn up on her grave. And there are thoughts that, you know, if you're going to a grave around Halloween season that you would leave a coin, which, um, you know, sort of talks about the myth and the folklore of the ferrymen um, ushering the spirit or the soul across River Six to the other side to be free. And if a spirit did not have a coin to pay the ferryman, that they would be doomed to walk this earth forever. So it's, um, it's sort of interesting again to see how this evolves around this time of year. So scarecrows, we love scarecrows. There are lots of scarecrow festivals here um, in New England. Um, a lot of towns will sort of do the, uh, the, the scarecrow dress up. Uh, you know, they have the, the little uh, neighborhood sort of gatherings where everybody um, you know, puts out their, their uh, scarecrows and people will go and do the tour. I know um, Chester, New Hampshire does a great scarecrow festival. But for thousands of years, scarecrows have helped humans save their crops from crows and predators. Um, scarecrows have been used in some form all over the world. The first scarecrows in history go back to the ancient Egyptians who used them to protect wheat fields along the Nile River from flocks of quail. In fact, the farmers would cover wooden frames with nets hanging over them so they could hide inside and actually capture the quails. In 2500 BC, Greek farmers carved wooden scarecrows to look like Priapus, the son of the god Dionysus and the goddess Aphrodite to keep the birds out of the vineyards. The scarecrows were painted purple with a sickle in one hand 
and a club in the other to bless the harvest. Some scarecrows in Germany were made to look like witches to hurry along the spring planting season. While in England, real children were known to stand on posts to keep animals away. Can you imagine looking out into the field and seeing children standing on the scarecrow posts? Of course, that evolved into gourds being used for faces and then the rest of the scarecrow being made from straw and old clothing. Made from uh, straw and old cast off clothes, the scarecrow sees more than you know. Ward my garden swell and protect us true under the midnight stars and skies of blue. So Portsmouth, um, New Hampshire, where, where I am right now, um, they do a great uh, Scarecrows of the Port Festival. My understanding is that um, they just started putting them up last night. So wherever you go in town, you have these really just fun characters um, all around up against the lamppost. And it's one of my favorite things um, about October. Um, they go up October 1st and they are like down by um, November 1st. I swear it's like, you know, by 1 a.m. on November 1st, they've all sort of scurried back to um, to the cornfields, but I I love how um, you know Portsmouth keeps this tradition alive throughout this this beautiful city. So there is some um, Halloween lore of corn. Speaking of corn, that corn could be used for divination purposes. Um, again, sort of going back to the adult parlor games that you would take um, and fill up a bag with corn. And you would assign, you know, um, uh, odd numbers would be yes, even numbers would be no. You'd ask your question and then reach into the bag, um, grab a handful of the corn kernels, count them out, and then again, see if it was even or odd. Um, and that would be either a yes or no form of divination. Uh, you could hang it on your door. So notice how um, it typically comes in three. So you would hang the corn on your door. Corn is all about um, prosperity and abundance because there are so many corn kernels on each ear of corn. And again, um, or counting it um, out from a pouch as well. I love um, all of sort of the, the jewel tones of Indian corn. It's always one of my favorite things to to uh, pick up from the local farm stands. But yeah, even, even corn has its uh, sort of place in folklore as well. Uh, if you like um, cakes and sweets, here we can see this beautiful uh, old postcard where uh, may this be your luck on Halloween and notice how the woman is pulling out this piece of cake and there's actually a ring inside of it. And that goes back to barmbrack, which is a traditional Irish cake. After pouring it into the prepared pan, it is tradition to add objects to the barmbrack, which symbolize certain things for the person who receives each in their slice. These objects can be pressed into the bottom of a loaf after baking instead. So a coin would represent wealth or good fortune, um, a ring maybe you'll marry within the year, um, a bean, poverty, uh, a pea you would not marry within the year, um, a matchstick would be an unhappy marriage, a thimble, single for life, like who would want to be the one to get the thimble? I mean, like you would just be the whole butt of all the jokes during the party. So um, it sort of reminds me of the tradition of king cakes um, that you'll find down in New Orleans for Mardi Gras. But again, you got, you got to kind of be careful here because, you know, if you eat the cake, you're eating your future. And certainly you don't want, you know, that to be, um, to be, uh, you know, uh, any, any sort of medical issue. But um, I, I love the, the whole idea of uh, the barn brack and just think it's amazing. Um, I, I mentioned it to uh, friends a few years ago and uh, they sort of took up the uh, tradition. But um, what we do is we, um, we cut it up and cut it very, very small. So that way there's no chance of eating anything dangerous. And what we put in there is, um, is big enough. And there's a, a lot of different ways that this can be done um, for Halloween, but it's just absolutely fascinating. This is a um, beautiful photo that I have in my collection um, that I picked up um, up at an antique shop in Maine. And I just adore uh, this woman's hair and how odd there is actually a Halloween hair charm from Maine. 
a piece of hair threaded into a yarn ball. Throw the yarn into a barn and repeat the following verse. Your true love will appear and wind the yarn with you when the clock strikes midnight on Halloween. So you would say, I wind, I wind my true love to find the color of his hair, the clothes he will wear the day he is married to me. Um, so again, there's like all these little uh, interesting um, folk ways out there. Um, also, it was thought that you would hang uh, juniper branches and dried rosemary on your door to keep any unhappy spirits away to again, sort of usher them along the path on Halloween. This is a, an interesting um, tidbit of Halloween folklore from the South. To go out early in the morning and proceed silently without speaking a word, take a clean white handkerchief with you, enter a graveyard, walk across it and pick up a small piece of earth as you make your wish. You may repeat this in two or more graveyards for two or more wishes. Then go home, put it way up high in a cupboard where no one except for a spider could disturb it. If you've kept totally silent until that moment, those wishes will come true before 12 moons have passed. And that is um, Halloween traditions in Louisiana in the Journal of American Folklore. The beautiful um, photo that you see here is of uh, Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is probably one of my favorite cemeteries in New England. So just a, a little bit more to go before we um, finish up. Uh, of course, a lot of people will also take, um, you know, this time of year or Halloween for their own sort of personal um, rituals and celebrations. And, you know, it, it is a very introspective time because we are, you know, we are thinking about superstition, thinking about the supernatural. Um, we're confronting our fears about death, which, you know, death in, you know, in colonial England was dealt with a, a little bit differently right up through, you know, the 1700s, even, you know, through the 1800s in part where, you know, we used to deal with, with death at home, you know, we had the wakes at home, we prepared the bodies at home, we would walk um, the deceased from the house to the burial ground. Um, you didn't send people away to, to be dealt with when they died. So it's very interesting how, you know, we're, we're removed from that, yet we still sort of reflect um, as the world around us, you know, goes through this very quick change of, you know, green lushness to, you know, beautiful color in a burst and then it's all gone and the, the trees are bare and, you know, you can, you can see a, a lot more shadow sometimes for some people in, um, in the cemeteries. Uh, this is a beautiful cemetery that I um, visited uh, up in uh, Maine last year. And it's just something about, you know, old, old cemetery gates on a, on a, cloudy fall day, that's just amazing. So I usually set up a little display in, um, in my house. This is a, I don't know, probably 10 years ago now. Um, you know, just lighting a lot of candles sitting in the dark and, you know, sort of reflecting um, on, on this time of year. As you can see, I actually found a candle that um, said cemetery gates on it. Um, you know, breaking out some, some stones and, you know, just, uh, just sitting there sort of in a uh, silent meditation. It's a picture from uh, this class that I did in person a few years ago. Um, we actually did break out nuts and uh, talked about nut divination. There's the cranberries and the apples and the corn and the cauldron. So um, I just, I, I love, uh, you know, all this Halloween folklore. Um, it's just really amazing. Cause again, it sort of uh, gives a, a greater depth to the traditions that we already celebrate. So I, I have to leave you with um, uh, a couple of interesting Halloween tales from New England. Um, you know, we, we think again, Halloween of being, you know, mis mischief and frolic. In uh, Danbury, New Hampshire, there was the strange tradition of the Halloween junk pile. In the middle of Halloween night, the junk pile would begin. Um, old bathtub, broken bicycles, junk cars, barrels, um, and trash would appear on the village common. No one ever saw who did it and no one was ever held responsible. And there was one year that little constable said he was going to investigate and hold people accountable. And guess what happened? An effigy of him was burned on the town common, according to local legend. 
in um, Ackworth, New Hampshire. Ackworth is the one town in New Hampshire I practically could not find. Um, you make one wrong turn when you're going to Ackworth and you're hours out of the way. Um, but there is a fascinating Halloween gravestone um, and legend and ghost story in Ackworth that relates to the old burial ground. And there is the stone. This stone tells the death of Bezalel Beckwith, not where his body lies. He died October 31st, 1824 at the age of 43, the 13th night after his body was stolen from the grave. And the gravestone reads, now twice bereaved, the mourner cries, my friend is dead, his body gone. God's act is just my heart replies, forgive, O oh God, what man has done. <coughs> excuse me, erected by the friends of the deceased in Ackworth in place of one destroyed by some ruthless hand, April 1853. This is a replacement gravestone designed after the original gravestone. Poor Bezalio was buried on Halloween. 13 days later, his body was stolen. It was believed that his body may have been taken by Dartmouth College students. Um, there was a man from Vermont that was brought up on charges. The charges were dismissed that his body was taken to be used um, for dissection by medical students. And um, someone stole the gravestone. So this replacement was put here in 1853. And it is said to be a very haunted cemetery, particularly around his grave on Halloween. So uh, I just thought I would share that little story with you. And there's there's lots of great um, Halloween little bits of folklore right here in our backyard in, um, in New England. So I wanna give you um, a couple of bits of homework or uh, you know, additional resources. So um, there is a fascinating Oracle card deck out there. It's called the Halloween Oracle by Stacey DeMarco. And um, even if you're not into you know, Oracle cards or tarot cards or anything like that, um, this tells a lot of the history and traditions on these uh, very colorful, beautiful cards. And um, it's really just kind of fun, even if you wanted to use them as part of a Halloween display. Um, they're, they're really just fantastic. A couple of great books, if you're not reading one of mine. Um, you can find both of these on Amazon, as well as mine. Um, Past the Glad and Summit Season, Homes for Halloween. Um, by K.A. Opperman, just love this great vintage artwork again. And then um, there is a coloring book of shadows, Season of the Witch by Amy Sasari, uh, which is of course, uh, Samhain and Halloween, really um, a lot of fun, beautiful graphics. And again, a little bit of folklore. <coughs> One of my um, favorite uh, pieces of clip art from back in the day, you can see this little pumpkin with with all the very concerned children's faces inside. So um, you can find me at um, RoxyZW on Instagram, always posting all kinds of interesting bits of folklore and New England history on there. And of course you can find me at newenglandcuriosities.com. You can find me at uh, Facebook at New England Curiosities as well. Um, I've been running New England Curiosities for 21 years. I post all the time. I have events all year long. And um, I, I love to engage people with history and folklore. It's just, it's, it's what I live for. Um, and I really, really hope that um, you enjoyed this evening's uh, presentation. I tried to do my best to, uh, to keep to time. Um, for ways that are dark and tricks that are vain, look out, it's Halloween time. Another great vintage postcard. So let me um, come back from the share. So here I am. Ta-da! Um, so I am uh, I am back from the share screen. It looks like yep. everything went fine. Everything so went like, fine, Roxy. So if anyone has any comments or questions for Roxy, let's get them into the Q and A or the chat. Thank you. Uh, Judith says, "Thank you for another spooky evening. See you soon." Um, let's see, Adair. Uh, I can only see half their name. I apologize. Uh, how did you get interested in this subject? Uh, was it a childhood experience? Oh, wow, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, like I said, I, I grew up in Western Massachusetts, very, very fascinated 
with sort of the agriculture around me. Um, we went more to farm stands than we actually went to the grocery store um, back in the day, sitting with a lot of, you know, the, the farmers and the farmers' wives and, you know, eating right out of the field. And a lot of people that I had talked to um, had immigrated from, you know, uh, Europe, like Poland and Germany and things like that. And we would sit and talk traditions. So um, that's one of my favorite things to do is just to, to sit and talk, you know, sort of old world stuff. And it just, um, it just amazed me. And I had such a deeper appreciation for the food I was eating and just the hard work that they put into it. And I've always loved Halloween. It's my, my favorite time of year, season of spirits, decorations, like it just speaks to me. Excellent. Uh, Nancy says, excellent evening, thank you. Betty says, very interesting presentation. Sandy says, I loved it. Uh, Brian asks, how long into the fall will you be doing tours, especially in Portsmouth? Um, so typically we go right through December. Um, I will be continuing our schedule right into the next year because we're doing a lot of events at one of our local haunted theaters in town. Um, which is the player's ring. So rather than having to worry about the outside weather, we'll be warm and cozy inside doing immersive theater experiences based on New England folklore. So you can go to my website and um, subscribe to my newsletter, go to Facebook page, or um, certainly you can check out uh, some of my events. Uh, Lindsay says, I loved hearing about the goblins picking up the house to keep things clean. Reminds me of the idea that vampires must count items. Um, ah. Roxy says, uh, no, you're Roxy. Kate I says, guess. Roxy, do you have any favorite cemeteries that you'd recommend to visit? Oh my gosh. Wow. That's a, that's a, that's a good question. Um, a lot of my books are on cemeteries, so I'd be remiss not to recommend one of my books. However, um, Mount Auburn for the fall is probably one of the most glorious cemeteries in Massachusetts. It's located in Cambridge. You can't see the whole place in, in a day. Um, so go early and see as much of it as you can. Um, there's, uh, gosh, Forest Hill, which is located in Jamaica Plain, which is where, where I will be inhabiting the ground one day, um, which is very similar to Mount Auburn. If you like the statuary, if you like the beautiful rolling landscapes, um, it's really amazing. A lot of famous people buried in those burial grounds as far as um, you know, some of my favorites in Massachusetts. So those would have to be two of my favorites. Obviously, um, you know, there's lots of others. Old Burial Hill in Marblehead is probably one of my other favorites. It's from 1638. It's just phenomenal. So if you are the type of person that loves to go to Salem, don't miss Marblehead. Marblehead is amazing. Check out that cemetery as well for something a little bit older. All right, Judith says, thank you, Roxy. This was a cool presentation. I loved this. Uh, Jody says, fun talk, very enjoyable, thank you. Elaine says, I took your tour of the cemeteries in New York Village. You did a fantastic job and I really enjoyed this presentation. Mm -hmm. Brian wants to know, Roxy, do you have a podcast? I do. Uh, my podcast is called Wicked Curious. Um, you can find it on Buzzsprout, iTunes, SoundCloud. Um, I've been doing it for three and a half years and it's just New England ghost stories, folklore, um, a few interviews with other ghost tour guides from around the country. And uh, it, sometimes I'll pop in some music and you can just subscribe to the podcast. I usually add um, a few episodes every month as I can. And there's probably over 50 on there right now. Uh, Tracy says, great slides, uh, very interesting. Elena says, I enjoyed the beautiful vintage postcards. Thank you. Brian recommends visiting the Point of Grave Cemetery in Portsmouth. Uh, Jamie recommends the Riverside Cemetery in Waterbury, Connecticut. Uh, Brian says, thank you for doing this. There was a lot of very interesting info. Uh, let me jump over here. Uh, Jane asks, uh, this was at the very beginning of your presentation, uh, what is a need fire? So a need fire is a fire that never goes out. So a need fire would be a fire that you would kindle other fires off of. So much like you would see in a lot of colonial kitchens, there would be a small fire that would be kept, particularly throughout the winter, that would be used if you needed to obtain fire for um, other purposes. So that's what a, a need fire is, really a fire that you need. And um, Brian, the Point of Graves is literally like two minutes outside my door right here. 
Uh, Jane also asks, what's your favorite haunted spot? Oh my gosh, that, I, I got another fully loaded question. Um, gosh, there's so many. I mean, I love, I love the Wentworth by the Sea, which is on the Great Island of Newcastle um, up here in New Hampshire. It's a beautiful uh, Victorian style hotel. It's just gorgeous. Um, I, I love haunted lighthouses. There are so many haunted lighthouses um, in New England. Um, probably one of my favorite places that I love to go exploring ghosts is down on Cape Cod. Actually, they've on the Cape for a short period of time. Um, the cemeteries down there are really amazing. Um, there's tales of haunted beaches, everything from uh, ghost ships and pirates to moon cussers. So that's one of my favorite places to actually go exploring the ghost stories and folklore is, um, is Cape Cod. Uh, Don wants to know if you've ever visited the Lakeview Cemetery in Cleveland. I have not. No, well, you'll have to reach out, reach out and let me know why I need to go. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. So, Don, let us know in the chat why that's a special one. Uh, Kate says, thank you, Roxy. May you have a blessed uh, Sam Hain. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. Uh, right. Cheryl says, thank you. Great talk. Uh, Adir says, so interesting. Halloween has always been my favorite event. Thank you so uh, very much for this excellent presentation with wonderful slides. I will read your books. Um, uh, Vanita says, thank you for a very interesting talk. Really kicked off the Halloween season for me. Uh, Sandy wants to know, what is your favorite haunted lighthouse? And before you answer, let's see if I'm quick enough. I probably won't be. Uh, we're hosting Jeremy de Tremont. I'm not sure if you know Jeremy Roxy. Uh, but we're hosting him in the next couple of weeks, and I'll, and I'll put information about that visit uh, in the chat. But do you have a favorite uh, Haunted Lighthouse? So I, I know Jeremy very, very well. Um, we both filmed a show for um, the History Channel. It was called Psychic History back in 2005 at Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse. I've known Jeremy for a very, very long time. Um, I, there are many, many amazing Haunted Lighthouses. Moon Island Lighthouse is, um, is definitely a favorite that people... Um, that ended up in a shipwreck there before the, the lighthouse was built, survived via cannibalism. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating and very, very creepy location out there uh, for sure. Um, there are ghosts around uh, Monomoy Island Lighthouse, which is down on the Cape. Um, ghosts of moon cussers that used to be down there. There's supposed to be the ghost of a horse that's around the lighthouse as well, which is very, very interesting. Um, I mean, there's, there's so, so many stories, Boston Light, has some great, uh, great ghosts as well. So it's hard to pick. And final question goes to Jamie who asks, do you have any other Zooms coming up? Oh gosh, I got, I got a ton of them. <laughs> if you go to my Facebook page um, and also on Mondays, I do a Facebook Live when you're curious from home and I talk about everything that's coming up that week. Um, I literally have stuff on my calendar every single day. If it's not a tour, it's a Zoom or it's an in-person presentation. I'm actually going to be in Massachusetts tomorrow um, for an in-person presentation. So um, just, just follow my page or um, you can email me directly. Um, there's a lot of different ways to sort of see what I'm doing because I need to see what I'm doing too. Otherwise, I'm not going to show up there because it gets kind of crazy. Uh, and then Don clarifies that Lakeview Cemetery is where President Garfield is buried. And you can spend an entire day walking through it. It's well worth the trip, she says. Uh, I will I will make a note of that. I love to travel, so fantastic. All right, well, we've reached our final comment. Uh, so Roxy, any last words before we wrap up for the evening? So I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share this folklore with you. And as you're putting out your pumpkins or hanging up your corn or you know going through your own rituals of the season, sort of think about the deeper meaning and the history behind them. And it'll enrich your experience and your appreciation for this time of year. And I hope you all have a wonderful month. So cool to be here. First day of October. Um, and maybe try something new this year. Uh, maybe, you know, if you haven't done some Halloween tradition, start one. So um, that's all, all I can I can tell you is, you know, I appreciate you being here. And obviously, there's something that interests you. So make, make it your own. <laughs>